It was a different kind of Passover, to say the least. I remember right when we sat down, Philip leaned over to me and whispers, Hey, Thomas, I feel like something special is going to happen tonight. I looked at him and I said, I doubt it. I was wrong. Jesus got up from the table. He walked over and grabbed a basin of water, a towel. I remember thinking at the time, and what's Jesus doing with that foot water? I doubt he's going to wash somebody's feet. I was wrong. He knelt down and began to watch Bartholomew's feet. Barth just sat there. He didn't say anything. He didn't move. None of us did. Jesus finished and went on to James and Andrew and the rest of us. I remember at the time thinking, this is so strange, yet wonderful. And I thought, I doubt anybody's going to say anything right now. I was wrong. You know who broke the silence? Peter. No way you're going to wash our feet. I mean, that's what I told him. He could wash other people's feet, but he wasn't going to wash mine. I looked at him and I said, Jesus, you are not going to wash our feet. I mean, you're the king. And he looked at me and he said, well, then you can have nothing to do with me. And I'm like, ouch, okay, wash my feet, wash my hands, wash my whole body if you have to. He looked at me and he said, no, your feet will be fine, Peter. In the midst of him washing our feet, he teaches us servanthood. When Jesus took some bread and some wine, he blessed it and served it to us. He said it was a new covenant with his blood, and he said, tonight all of you will lose faith in me. I remember thinking right then, lose faith in you? Never. But I didn't say anything. I just sat there. I couldn't just sit there. I had to say something. So I looked at him and I said, Jesus, I love you. You can count on me. Everyone else may fall away, but I will not. You can count on me. He looked at me and he smiled and he said, Peter, you'll deny me three times by tomorrow morning. I said, ouch. The next thing I knew, we were wrapping things up and we we're headed to the garden to pray. Once we got to the garden, things just got crazy. Uh, Jesus asked Peter, James, and myself to go further in with him and join him in prayer. Um, and we tried, uh, we just kept falling asleep. Uh, but Jesus kept waking us up, and he told us that the, uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And it's all true, but that whole evening is just a whole blur. Uh, I can't believe that Judas started this whole thing. He couldn't have thought that what he was doing was right. There he is. He's the one you want. The one praying by himself. Now the others, they will come up and try to create some scene. But the one that I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you want. Now, 30 pieces of silver, right? That's what we agreed upon, 30 pieces. Forget about the rest. The one that I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you want. A kiss? Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss of friendship? Then things just got crazy. Peter grabs a sword and he chops off this guy's ear. Uh, but Jesus reaches down and, and picks it up and puts it right back on his head and it looked like nothing had happened. Then they, they took him, and uh, I would like to say that I did something, we did something, uh, but I didn't. And uh, we just ran. I ran. And, and I'm so ashamed. What have I done? What have I done? Was I so stupid to think that I've killed him. I've killed him. I crucified Jesus. I crucified Jesus. It's what the crowd wanted and it's what they got. Personally, I don't feel like that man did anything to deserve that, but I was just a soldier doing my job. When the governor gave his sentence, that's when I would go to work. I love that job. I felt like I was administering justice every time I nailed someone to a tree. That man, though, didn't deserve that. It just didn't make sense to me. It makes no sense. There I was, rotting in a jail cell, stealing, murdering, you name it, I've done it. And I knew the next time I stepped foot outside the jail cell, well, that was it. So the guards, they came and got me and they put me beside this guy that was beaten to a pulp. Then Governor Pilate started asking the crowd, which one of these men do you want to be set free? I mean, it was obvious. I mean, the crowd, they're going to say, let Jesus go. And then I was going to tell them where they could go. And then the crowd, they started chanting Barabbas. I mean, they're saying my name. 
They're saying my name over and over and over again. The guards, they threw me to the crowd and they took Jesus to Golgotha. I mean, one minute I am a man marked for death. And the next, I'm free. It made no sense. So I followed them all the way to Golgotha. I was stationed at Golgotha that day. We just raised a second criminal and they brought him to me. I'll never forget the way he looked. He'd been beaten, spit on, whipped. He was unrecognizable as a man, hideous. What was left of his clothes were stripped off of him and he was thrown down on the cross. That's when I went to work. Generally, when you crucify man, the first hand is the most difficult. The criminal wants to get away, he fights you. So I'd have two soldiers hold him down, but this guy, he didn't put up a fight. I just thought he was exhausted. As an executioner, I've been called every name in the book. I've had men yell at me, plead with me, but I wasn't prepared for that. He looked at us. He looked at me. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He forgave me. Forgive them. He said, forgive them. Who is he forgiving? It was me. It should have been me up there. I was the one that was supposed to be hanging on that cross. He took my place. Then I looked up and I remember he took a deep, agonizing breath. And he said, it is finished. Surely this man was the son of God. But Sunday's coming, and Sunday is Easter. And I just want to mention very quickly, if you're planning on being here Sunday morning, if you are able to attend the 8.30 service, that would, uh, that would help us out quite a bit. We anticipate our 10 o'clock service being uh, packed, and so if you're able, uh, be here at 8.30. And then join us at the uh, park at Long's Family Memorial Park for a picnic after our uh, 10 o'clock service. Around 11.15, we'll be out there. Uh, today we're going to conclude our series, His Final Teachings, and uh, we've been studying through the, the teachings that Jesus had for his disciples the last few hours of his life, uh, before he was betrayed, arrested, tortured, and crucified. And we'll be in John chapter 18 today, where Jesus was arrested and the mock trials began. Now, after John 18, we're going to jump into John 19 for just a few verses, just a few verses. After Jesus was arrested. After that, we're going to take a, a quick pass back on John chapter 18. And I want to include several truths that his disciples saw firsthand. Truths that we can apply to our lives as well. But I need you to understand, the message today is going to feel unfinished. That's where we're going to leave tonight. It's going to feel unfinished. But remember again, Sunday is coming. This is Good Friday. I'm not going to teach about the good part yet. I hope that you will come back here again on Sunday morning. The good part would be what? When we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Sunday morning. Now, I'll probably err a little bit and mention it a few times as we get through the text tonight, but I do want you to know it's going to be a little bit unfinished as Jesus heads for his crucifixion. Now, you're gathered here on Good Friday. I'm going to make some assumptions one of those being that you believe in Jesus, that you believe that he died, that you believe that he was buried, that you believe that he rose again on Sunday morning. Otherwise, I, I assume you wouldn't be here tonight. So I hope that you can track with me with that assumption today. I want to start in John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. John says this is why he wrote the entire book. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, in the book of John. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And by believing, you may have life in his name. John says this is why he wrote the book. He wants people to have life in the name of Jesus. And I want people to have life in the name of Jesus. I hope that you want everyone to have life life in the name of Jesus. I mean, if everyone knew Jesus, if everyone followed Jesus, the world would be a better place. And it's kind of a crazy place these days. Heaven would be whole. It'd be a big 
party. So that being said, let's get to John 18. John 18 verse 1 begins this way. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. I want to stop there for just a moment. The Kidron Valley is a valley between the city of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives, where the Garden of Gethsemane is at. Now, last week, if you happen to be here, I made a distinction. I'm going to do so again today about how the text kind of plays out from John 14 through John 18. And I'm a visual learner. Anybody else a visual learner? I know that when we see things, we can better connect with them oftentimes. We can remember them more easily as well. So I brought some pictures today. This first picture, this is a picture of Jerusalem from the vantage point. Just ignore my, uh, my highlighting for just a moment. We'll get to that. But this is a picture of the city of Jerusalem from the vantage point of the Mount of Olives, from the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, this yellow box down here, this is the area of where the Brook Kidron would be, the Kidron Valley between the Mount of Olives and the city of Jerusalem. The green here, a little bit hard to distinguish, but that is the Temple Mount area. It's roughly 38 acres. It's an elevated area where the temple used to be in Jesus' day, before it was destroyed in 70 A.D., which Jesus predicted would happen. Now, there stands a building there called the Dome of the Rock. It's the most notable building there. It was built around 685 A.D., and it's a shrine for Muslim pilgrims. Now, if you were here last week, I mentioned at the end of John chapter 14, Jesus said this, Come now, let us leave. They've been in that upper room. They shared in the Last Supper together. Jesus had some things to encourage them with. He washed their feet, and then he said, Come now, let us leave. And then John 18, verse 1, which we just read, begins with, When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. John 14, the end. John 18, the beginning. Three chapters there. And it just feels like maybe they've been standing in that upper room doorway this entire time, and Jesus has been praying as they're kind of getting ready to head out. But I don't think that's quite what happened. It's probable what John records in John 18 as they went out, it's probably they were going out of the city of Jerusalem. Now the city ends at the wall, the city wall. The upper room is likely over here where the blue circle is at, kind of off in the distance there. They would have walked along the south end of the temple, which is where the red circle is at, along the southern steps of the Temple Mount area. Um, It's where people entered and exited the temple. There's a lot of mikvahs there. Those were ceremonial uh, bathing areas, pools for people to cleanse themselves before they went into the temple area. Jesus did a lot of teaching. If you look throughout the Gospels, he did a lot of teaching where that red circle is at. A great deal of teaching on the southern steps there. Maybe as they made their way from the upper room in the blue circle area, down here through the Kidron Valley and up on the other side to the Mount of Olives, Maybe he taught along the way. Maybe he prayed along the way. Maybe he paused along the way on those southern steps again. The garden is close by. It's easily within walking distance of the city. I want to show you another picture. Now imagine that you're standing there on the southern steps, and you've got a, you're kind of looking up at the Mount of Olives. My daughter's rolling her eyes right now. But anyway, just imagine that you are looking up at the Mount of Olives. I shouldn't have called her out like that. Now here I've done it again. But anyway, you're looking up at the Mount of Olives from that vantage point of the southern steps. That's the next picture, what you would see. This is uh, the Mount of Olives up here. Um, You've got olive trees all over the place. You've got a church that's now been built around this Garden of Gethsemane. This is the Garden of Gethsemane area. There are a lot of old uh, olive trees in that that space. Uh, Here's a picture of one of the oldest existing olive trees. They believe this tree, some people believe this tree to be about 2,000 years old, which of course would put it in the time period of Jesus' day. Now, I don't know, they don't know, but they guess it might be about that old. Maybe it is an offspring of one of the olive trees that Jesus would have been around, where he would have slept or rested underneath when he spent time in the garden. But this is the place That Garden of Gethsemane area, that is the place where Jesus and his disciples would often hang out. We don't read it in John's account, but in Luke's account, we read this about the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, which is also the Garden of Gethsemane, and his disciples 
followed him as usual. They went out there. They went out again that night, and it was late that evening when they entered the garden. Judas, the betrayer, he knew where they would be. He had been there with them before. Now, if we roll back a little bit in the Gospel of John to John chapter 13, it records that Jesus and his disciples, again, they'd been in that upper room. They'd had the Last Supper. Jesus had washed their feet. He'd instituted communion, which, by the way, we will share in communion at the end of this message before we sing one more final song. But at some point, Jesus said this, Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. While they were in the upper room gathered together, Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. John asked Jesus this, Lord, who is it? Which one of us is going to betray you? Now, the disciples are a little bit slow to catch up. And so Jesus says this to them, verse 26. It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I've dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Jesus takes a piece of bread Dips it in a dish, gives it to Judas. The guys still didn't know who it was going to be, who was going to betray Jesus. John says, we just thought he was leaving to, you know, maybe go give something, something to uh, the poor. Maybe he was going to go get some things for the party. We didn't think anything of it. Verse 27, what you're about to do, do quickly, Jesus says to Judas. The disciples missed it, and then Judas was gone. And Judas missed out on the rest of his final teachings, of Jesus' final teachings. But you know what? It's okay. Because Judas didn't need it. Judas wasn't on Team Jesus. Now that being said, back to John 18. John 18, verse 2. Now Judas, who betrayed him, who betrayed Jesus, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Now this is not the point of the message. But a quick sidetrack here because... It's pretty obvious, and then we'll move on. No one can betray you like someone on the inside. No one can betray you like someone on the inside. That's what happened to Jesus here. Verse 3. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Now that word detachment there, detachment of soldiers, the original Greek word is the Greek word spira. Your Bible might translate it as cohort or maybe band. From the original language, what John writes down meant one-tenth of a legion. A legion was 6,000 soldiers. We don't know how many, but many, a lot. Maybe, maybe up to 600 soldiers were along with Judas. The religious leaders didn't want to take any chances about missing out on this opportunity to arrest Jesus. Now we have seen, if you've been along for the journey as we have made our way through the Gospel of John, we have seen the religious leaders try multiple times to take Jesus out, to arrest him, to stone him. They wanted to kill him, but he kind of slips away into the crowd every single time, and they didn't want to miss one more opportunity. They had someone on the inside, and so they send this overwhelming force along with Judas to the Garden of Gethsemane. They didn't know what would happen when they showed up. They didn't know but that Jesus might have a a group of his own followers or supporters there ready to fight and defend him. Verse 4, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it you want. Again, you might remember the moments through our study in the book of John where they tried to arrest him. They tried to kill him, and he would just slip into the crowd. It wasn't yet his time, the Bible would tell us. John would record for us. It wasn't yet his time. But in this moment, the time has come. So Jesus approaches them. It says he went out, approaches them, and says to them, who, who is it that you want? Verse 5, Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Now, we don't pick up on this today in our modern kind of American language and understanding. But that word right there was a slam. It was a dig when they said Jesus of Nazareth. No one liked Nazareth back then. Now, maybe maybe you remember this. Maybe you don't. But back back when ISIS was taking large swaths of Iraq and Syria to set up their Islamic state... They would mark the homes of known Christians with this symbol. 
this symbol on the wall. And the symbol is not the circle. It's what's inside of the circle. But ISIS would then, they would mark the home, they would mark the wall, and then they would give an ultimatum. You can either convert to Islam, you can pay a tax to live as a non-Muslim in Muslim territory, you can abandon your home and possessions with just the clothing on your back, or die. Those are your options. That symbol in Arabic is, is for the letter N. They would put an N on the wall of the homes of people who were Christians. Why not a J for Jesus? Why not a C for Christian? They chose N for Nazarene, meaning the person who lives in this home follows Jesus of Nazareth. It was used as a pejorative. It was used as a slam, a dig, much like in the text when Jesus says, who is it that you want? Who is it that you're looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Let's keep going. I am he, Jesus responds. Now, maybe you have a footnote in your Bible. The footnote in my Bible actually uses the word I am or the phrase I am. And in the original language, Jesus said the Greek word I me, meaning I am. Our English translations, they read I am he to make sense for us with grammar. But Jesus said, I am. Now, if you know your Old Testament history, you know what Jesus might have been saying there. He used the same name that God used to refer to himself when talking with Moses. Back in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, God had called Moses to go to Egypt to set his people free, to release them from the bondage from Egypt as slaves. Moses was hesitant at first, but at some point he says, hey, okay, but show me some ID." I need, to, I need to see some ID, God. Like, when they ask who it is that has sent me to them, who, who, what am I supposed to say? And God says to Moses, tell them, I am has sent you to me. I am, meaning I have always been. I always will be. I exist without beginning or end. I am. That is the name that God used for himself. And I would argue there's a 100% chance Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He's making his final stand to these religious leaders before he was arrested. And those religious leaders, those authorities, heard it loud and clear. Later on, in John 19, when Jesus was on trial before Pilate, the religious leaders, they were making their case that Jesus must die. John 19, verse 7, the Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law. And according to that law, he, Jesus, must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. They said he's made himself equal with God. He's claiming to be the Son of God. Jesus used the phrase, I, me, I am, to make that point again about who he really is. Now, John, uh, he kind of adds this detail there that Judas the traitor was standing there with them. Judas was on the wrong team. Now, there are some people in the world that believe that everybody's good. Like, everybody's just good. I've heard people say, you know, I just, I believe that everybody's good. Like, good, good nature. I, I just believe that. I've heard pastors, preachers, ministers say, well, I believe every, everybody's just good. I'm going to go on record today and say, everybody is bad. We, we all have a bent towards sin. Everybody is bad. <laughs> Every one of us has that sinful nature in us. If you don't believe that to be true, you have never been around toddlers. You you have to teach a toddler good. You have to teach a toddler not to punch their sibling in the face. You have to teach a toddler not to take from their friend or their their sibling. You, You have to teach those things. Every single one of us has a bent toward sin. Every single one of us are bad. Now that being said, some people in this world are really bad. Now I have heard it said in recent years, and uh, I hope, uh, you know, that when someone is really mad, that they are big mad. Like that's, I heard some young people say that once, like he was really, he was big mad, like big mad. And so I, if someone is really bad, are they big bad? Like I was just thinking if that's true, maybe the author of The Three Little Pigs was onto something with the big bad wolf, okay? But yeah, I I I thought I'd try. Some some people though are really, really bad, like evil, like not just a bent towards sin, but downright evil. Those people have given themselves entirely over to the evil one, and we have seen yet 
another example of that just in recent weeks with the terrorist attack in Russia. Not just a bent towards sin or temptation, but evil, really bad. Judas was at that point after spending the better part of three, three and a half years following after Jesus and watching him and observing him and being cared for by him and, and listening to him teach and seeing how he treated those other, other, other people around him and watching him do miracles. In this moment, Judas's heart is cold. He's standing there with the soldiers, with the religious leaders, everyone who wanted Jesus dead, those who wanted to take Jesus into custody. And Judas mistakenly thought that he was on the right team in that moment. Now, a few days, you fast forward from this moment, and Judas would be dead, and Jesus would be alive again. But at that moment, it sure looked like Judas chose right. I mean, again, chose the winning team. Maybe, perhaps, as many as 600 soldiers. He had the temple guard. He had the politicians. He has the religious leaders. He has all the powers of the world in that area of the world at that day on his side. Everybody. It seemed like game over, but not so fast. Verse 6, when Jesus said, I am he, that phrase again, I me, they drew back and fell to the ground. So the crowd is there to arrest Jesus. And Jesus says, I me. And they start to backpedal, stepping on each other's toes and fell like dominoes. And I don't know how many fell or who fell, but it had to have been an awkward moment as they were standing back up. And it shows us who has the power. With one word, I me. Jesus lays them out. As they're standing back up, verse 7, <clears throat> again he asked them, who is it you want? And Jesus of Nazareth, they said. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. Again, I'm me. Think about who's watching this happen. I mean, there's, the disciples are watching this play out. And they haven't abandoned Jesus yet. They will soon enough. But everything that he's taught them over the last three years, he's reinforcing. And it's not in a a sermon on a sunny hillside. It's not in a debriefing moment along the Sea of Galilee. It's not in a casual conversation as they're walking down a dusty road. But in the darkness of a night, in a garden, in the presence of his enemies, Jesus is not backing down. And then Jesus says this, verse 8, If you're looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those that you gave me. Take me, let these guys go. Even in those tense moments, Jesus was thinking about his friends. Let them go. Take me, let them go. And so they did. They took Jesus. The first stop was the home of Annas, the father-in-law of the high priest that year. Obviously, there's some power dynamics at play if he goes to the father-in-law's house first. Next, they went to the home of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Then to Pilate, Pilate sends Jesus to King Herod. King Herod sends him back to Pilate. This went on throughout this long, horrific night. Finally, when he's back to Pilate again, Pilate realized he couldn't wriggle out of this. I mean, maybe I'm giving Pilate the benefit of the doubt, but I'm guessing he was just worn down from all this mess and finally just handed Jesus over to the soldiers to be crucified. Now, before we... Before we go to the crucifixion, I want to fly over this text one more time and step back into the Garden of Gethsemane for a few of these lessons from Jesus' arrest. The disciples saw this up close. I'm hoping that we can picture this this evening and learn a thing or two from his arrest as well and appreciate him and love Jesus even more. First of all, Jesus is beyond brave. Jesus is beyond brave. There are, there are critics of Jesus who would try to paint Jesus as some wimpy, effeminate, aimless hippie dude who wandered the hillside picking flowers and preaching about love all the time. There are people who would paint Jesus that way. If anyone thinks that Jesus might be weak and timid, know this, Jesus is beyond brave. The disciples personally saw this play out. Verse 4 again, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, he went out to the mob. He went out to the crowd and he asked them, who is it that you're looking for? Knowing that they would put a towel over his head and they would punch him in the face and mock him and say, hey, if you're a prophet, tell us who hit you. Knowing that he would be beaten and knowing that he would be whipped with a cat of nine tails. 
that whip of, of nine tails with a piece of bone or, or a stone or something sharp at the end of it, and they would lay that across the back, and they would rip the flesh loose. 350 gashes across his back. His lower legs ripped wide open. A crown of thorns placed upon his, knowing all that would happen, knowing that he would be spat upon, knowing he would be laid down on a cross and his hands and his feet nailed to that cross, knowing all that was about to happen to him. He did what? He went out to them. He walked into the pain. He went out to them. Now I have come to a point in my life where I'm actually thankful that I don't always know what's coming. <laughs> I'm actually thankful that I don't always know what's going to happen next. I mean, there are times, there are moments in my life that if I had known what was going to happen in my life, I probably would have exited and ran for the hills. There are things that have happened. I just, I don't, I don't, I'm grateful I didn't know it was going to happen. But God has given us, in His grace and mercy, not telling us everything that's going to happen, but, but the opportunity to live this out in 24-hour kind of bite-sized daily chunks. That's how we get to do life. I've had a few things happen that have been difficult, and I'm glad I didn't know it was going to happen. I've had a few medical things happen, some by my choice, some by accident, but it, you know, some, some things have happened, and the doctor comes in. He's like, hey, so this is what we're going to do. A uh, nurse comes in, hey, this is what we're going to do. And I'm thinking, uh, just stop. Hold on. Are you trying to help me or, uh, or not? No, we're trying to help you. Okay, then I don't really need to know what you're going to do. Uh, just put me under, take care of it, and I'll see you on the other side. Uh, maybe a few of you can relate, but there are moments where I don't really know what's going to happen. I don't want to know what's going to happen because I don't know if I would have gone out. I don't know if I would have stepped forward in that moment and Jesus went out knowing all that was about to happen to him. He went out to them. Now, John doesn't record Jesus' prayers from the Garden of Gethsemane. In the book of Luke, though, we do get some indications of what Jesus was praying about in the Garden. Luke 22, verse 42. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Father, if there is any other way, please, but not my will, but yours be done. What Jesus was facing was real and beyond painful, and he knew it. He was praying to God, his Father, to give him strength. In verse 43, we find out an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him in that moment. So by the time that Judas and this detachment, this band, this cohort of soldiers and others, by the time they get there to arrest him, Jesus is ready, and he steps forward into their custody and into the pain. For anyone who has ever doubted the bravery of Jesus... I hope you know your Lord and Savior is beyond brave. There's another lesson from Jesus' arrest. Jesus is the only one between us and death. As Jesus turned himself in, he ensured that his friends could go free. Again, verse 5. I told you, verse 8, sorry, I told you that I am he. If you're looking for me, then let these men go. And if you ever look for like nuggets in Scripture of wisdom or, or insight, this is the gospel message in a verse. If you're looking for me, then let them go. This is the good news of Jesus. This is the gospel in a nutshell. This is what Jesus did for you. The devil came looking to destroy you. And Jesus says, no. The devil wanted to cash in on the sin debt that you owed. And Jesus says, no, take me, let him go, let her go. Jesus took your sins to the cross so that you could go free. And I wonder how many times in our lives have we been maybe an instant from danger, an instant from disaster, and Jesus stepped in between us and the evil one and said, not today, Satan. I took care of that on the cross. Not today. Now, if you have your child with you today, you may not want to answer this question by raising your hand, but how many of us might consider raising our hand to say, yeah, uh, there's some things that have happened in my life or things I've done in my life that I probably shouldn't be alive any longer. But Jesus, something about Jesus, he stepped in and took care of it. Jesus is the only one between us and death, and he's the only one between us and hell for all eternity, and he's good for the payment. He took care of it on the cross. Take me 
and let them go. There's another lesson from Jesus' arrest. No matter how it looks, Jesus has the victory. That evening, his disciples, they got to see the first part of this. And then a few days later, on Sunday morning, they got to see the whole thing. Judas has done this head count, right? And he's decided which team he's going to go with. He has the most people, the most power. He chose the government, the politicians, the religious leaders, maybe 600 soldiers. And on the other side is Team Jesus. Jesus and a few groggy fishermen who couldn't stay awake for an hour while he prayed. And Jesus steps forward. He goes out to them and he says, I got this. One of his disciples, Simon Peter, thought that he could help. Verse 10, then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Now, there's several details here in John, but over in Matthew's account, we read a few more details. Matthew 26, put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Now, Jesus could have made that call, but he didn't. He didn't call 12,000 angels to help him, to aid him, because he needed to go to the cross for you and for me. Now, I don't know if you've ever watched too much TV or uh, maybe, you know, found a few things on the Google that would tell you that life is just a mess right now. And you know what? Uh, I just don't know if... Uh, I just don't know if us Christians are going to make it. Uh, you know, maybe you've read some things or seen some things that have got you with a little bit of doubt. Christians are outnumbered. I think we might lose this. We're not the home team anymore. We're definitely the visiting team. We're the losing team. Maybe. If you've ever thought that, know this. Jesus has already won the victory. He is the almighty, all-powerful, great I am, the Lion of Judah. He has already won the victory. And if Jesus is all you've got, then, then friend... You have all that you need. With Jesus, you always are in the majority. He gave himself up in the garden, ready to go to the cross so that you can experience heaven one day. There's another lesson from Jesus' arrest. Jesus corrects our mistakes along the way. He corrects our mistakes along the way. Again, Peter cut this guy's ear off. You know, Peter was going to be a church leader. He would be a church leader later on. And so you know, in case you're misinformed he didn't try to cut the guy's ear off he tried to cut the guy's head off and he missed and got his ear it's not like he said hey come here let me cut off your ear no he was trying and he missed and jesus had to have been thinking brother brother oh peter come here malchus Boop. you know takes care of it, and Malchus is like, hey, I'm going to press charges. We're cool, Peter. Fine. Thanks, Jesus. You know, gets him out of a jam. How many times has Jesus put ears back on people for you? You've said some things and done some things. You've gotten yourself in trouble, and Jesus is coming along after you, fixing problems and mending relationships so that we can continue to live our lives and hopefully live for him. How many times? John 19, we have to go there. Two and a half verses. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him. And with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. And that's it. I told you this message was going to feel just a little bit incomplete today. But you know this because you're here on Good Friday. And I know this, that this is not the end of the story. You cannot keep a good man down, and Jesus is so much more than a good man. He is God in the flesh. His enemies didn't believe it. His friends betrayed him, denied him, abandoned him. The demons of hell thought they had a victory. Get ready because Sunday's coming. Now, I hope you uh, were able to get communion on your way in today. I don't want you to get that ready. If you'll turn it upside down and open that up, we'll get to that in just a moment. 
I hope that you will join us again on Sunday when we celebrate the resurrection of the one who is beyond brave, the one who is between us and death. He takes our punishment for us, the one who has the final victory, the one who corrects our mistakes along the way. Because of them, we can, him, we can have victory in this life and we can experience heaven one day with God our Father. Now, a few hours before this, as they were in the upper room, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Let's eat the bread. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's drink the cup. Jesus said, I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you, in my Father's kingdom. One day, we will join together around the table of the Lamb. And we will enjoy a meal together with Jesus in our presence and God the Father there as well. Let me pray for us, and then we're going to sing one final song on this good, good Friday. God, thank you for the day. Thank you for your love for us. You sent your son Jesus here to die on a cross in our place. We are grateful. Father, help us to live in a way that honors you and lifts up the name of Jesus. That anyone who interacts with us would notice a difference. Father, help us to be on mission. That we would help people find and follow Jesus with their lives. That anyone and everyone who is searching for truth would find it. We love and praise you. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the deer stand best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, the old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God, left his glory above to bear it to dark calvary so i'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last i lay down i will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. In the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For twas on the old cross, Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me oh 
so I cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown to the old rugged cross I will ever be true its shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share so I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. Thank you for coming and worshiping and listening. We hope to see you on Sunday. You are all dismissed.